I say to everyone, um, just, I know I know most of you, but just to tell those of you who don't know me a little bit about myself, usually the first question that I always get is, where did you learn your good English, okay? <laughs> and my good English was learned in Providence, Rhode Island, okay, which is where I was born and raised. Uh, I've lived here in Florence now uh, for the better part of 20 years, and I came over way back in 1996 uh, with Syracuse University on a graduate program in fine arts. Um, I still teach for the Syracuse program today. I also teach for the Kent State University program from Ohio. I teach for the Boston College program as well. Uh, and for those of you who are new to Florence, if you haven't seen them yet, you will quite soon. And that is the very many American University students who are running around this town. Uh, Florence is one of the world's most popular destinations for study abroad. Uh, and in fact, the statistic from 2012 was that there were about 48 American universities and colleges that were sending their students here to study. Uh, and we had an undergraduate population of just over 10,000 as well. Right? And those of you who know Florence know it's not a very large city. Uh, there are only about 480,000 permanent residents. Uh, so that means that about 2% of the city's population is made up of American college kids, right? <laughs> what you would define as a high profile position in the city, right? Uh, and what I do year round is to teach art history to these students who come over for the semester or for the year. Right? Now what I'm gonna do with you this evening instead uh, is to talk about something that I very rarely get to talk about when I come here, and that's actually Florence, right? I'm always usually so specific in my subjects that tonight I thought I'd be a bit more uh, general in kind of looking over the city. And in fact, the first photograph that I'm showing you here, I used to illustrate the skyline of Florence uh, the way you see it today in 2014. Right? And the church that's closest to the camera is the one right there. Of course, the Church of Santa Croce, which is technically the world's largest Franciscan church. And construction on that building started in the year 1294. Right? Across town, of course, the marble-clad structure is the Cathedral of Florence, technically the world's third largest Christian church. And construction there started in the year 1296. Right in front of it, you can make out the brownstone tower here, which sits on one of the more important museums of Florence called the Bargello, right, the National Sculpture Gallery of the city. But the building that houses the gallery dates back to the year 1255. Next to it, the pointy brownstone tower sits on an urban monastery right in the center of the city called the Badia, right, built in the 1230s. And then across town again, the massive brownstone tower that you see sits on a building called Palazzo Vecchio, right, built as town hall beginning in the year 1299. It still serves as town hall today in 2014. Not bad for continuity, right? About 700 years or so. And then right next to it, the smaller tower that you see sits on the major Dominican church of Florence, which is called Santa Maria Novella, which is where, of course, our train station gets its name because it's located right behind the church, okay? And that church went up in the year 1279. Now, the reason I'm throwing all these dates at you right off the bat is that you may have picked up a pattern here Almost the entire skyline of Florence dates back to the, to the 1200s to the 13th century. Okay? And this is a very important point to begin with because most people who come to Florence come here looking for something called the Renaissance, right? the rebirth of all things Greek and Roman. But consider that the Renaissance did not begin until the year 1400. So technically, Florence is not a Renaissance city. It is a medieval city where the Renaissance began. Okay? Oh, I need my clicker. Thank you, okay? In fact, if you want to know what Florence looked like during the Renaissance, okay, um, here you go. Okay? And remember, in a world without photography, we'll take anything we can get, right? And that image right there, that picture is just as good as the photograph I showed you, except this is Florence in the year 1471. Let me give you a little context. Uh, a guy named Leonardo da Vinci was a 19-year-old hell-raising teenager running through the streets of the city, right? A guy named Michelangelo, not yet born. He would be born four years later in 1475. But this is the city in which both of these artists grew up. Right? So let's go monument for monument again, but let's go backwards this time. Right? We start with the Dominican church of Santa Maria Novella, already standing by 1471. You notice, of course, there's no train station in this painting. Right? Leonardo was working on that project, but he hadn't quite finished it yet. Right? Across town, the cathedral already standing. If you look here, you'll see the Bargello. And if you look carefully right next to it, you can see the Badia bell tower as well. Further to the left, you see Palazzo Vecchio. And then behind it to the left, you also see the church of Santa Croce. 
In other words, 540 years ago, the city looked more or less the same as it does today. Right. Let's get these people into the room here. Oh, that's okay. okay. Point being, when you come to Florence, you know, it's not just the museums and the churches and what have you, but you know, it, every time you're walking down one of the narrow streets or back alleys of the city, remind yourselves that you're walking down the same streets and alleys that artists like Dante and Giotto and Leonardo and Michelangelo walked as many as 700 years ago. Right? There is no other city in the world that can brag to that experience. Right? Go to the next, please. Okay, now most people who come to Florence, of course, imagine that the two major sites in the city are the Uffizi and the Accademia. Right? In fact, that's what guidebooks tell us today. Once you've been to those two museums, you can say, as all my students do, you have done the city of Florence. Okay? Whatever that might imply, by the way. Right? <laughs> Ask the people who live here which one of the monuments is the most important, and they're going to surprise you by telling you this one. Okay. The baptistry, dedicated like all baptistries to the guy who invented baptism in his name, John the Baptist, right? who also happens to be the patron saint of Florence, our biggest feast day of the year, June 24th, the feast day of St. John. And the reasons that this building is so important is one, its age, right? 1059 makes this building approximately how old? About a thousand years old. Okay, and coming from the United States, we have no idea what it means when something is a thousand years old, right? You can nod your head all you want, but there's nothing in U.S. history that we can balance this against, right? This past 4th of July, I was teaching a group of students uh, from Loyola Marymount University and teasing them about the whopping 238 years of American history that we celebrated this year, right? Remember, by European standards, 238 years ago is the day before yesterday, right? A thousand years old is getting there, right? But the other reason the structure is so important is that up until the 18th century, it was the exclusive place for baptisms in this city, the only place where they occurred, and all Florentines were baptized twice. They poured water the first time, you became a Christian. Immediately again, you became a Florentine. You're initiated into your religion and into your society at the same time. Right? Go to the next. Now, for those of you who have not been inside the baptistry, right, I strongly suggest you do. Right? Uh, you walk in and look up, and the entire ceiling is covered in a medium called mosaic. All right? You all familiar with little pieces of tiles, right? And the tiles are normally made from? Now, the rule of thumb is a floor mosaic will be made of stone, a wall, or a ceiling mosaic instead made of glass. And these tiles are tiny, right? They're about the size of our teeth, and they embed these things in wet plaster to create the images. Now, just how big is the mosaic? Can you all make out the figure of Jesus Christ down here? He's exactly 19 feet tall. Okay, so this is quite large. In fact, here's a close-up. You notice that Jesus looks pretty serious in the image, right? staring straight out at you with his hands in this kind of hieroglyphic position. Right? Because the main subject of the mosaic through one, two, three sections is what we call last judgment. Right? Christian belief that time, that all things, will technically come to an end. Christ will return to judge all of us definitively. So his hand placement is indicating judgment. The right hand is supposed to be doing this. It's an upward gesture, right? And with it, he's inviting a very small group of people up there into heaven. Now, if you're concerned, and you should be, why that group of people going up into heaven is so small, right? The reason is that in the Middle Ages, they took the literary source for Last Judgment, which is the last book of the Bible, called the Book of, and in Revelation, there's an exact number for the capacity of heaven. Does anyone know what that number is? It's not the most encouraging figure in the world. Let me start off by telling you that. Right? The number is 144,000. That's it. Then they shut the doors. Okay? And to make matters worse, if you look at this group of figures, can you make out the guy wearing black and white right here in the front row? Okay, these are the traditional colors of the Dominican order. Okay? In other words, that's either St. Dominic himself or a Dominican priest or what have you. Guy in the back row is wearing a long brown hooded habit, right? So he is a Franciscan. In other words, if there's only room for 144,000 people, but most places are already reserved for priests and nuns and saints and martyrs and everyone else, that means that our chances plummet even further, right? Sorry to break the news to you tonight, right? But that's the way they saw it back then, right? So where are the vast majority of us going, right? Jesus' left hand, and the Italian word for the left is? 
sinistra, right? From the Latin sinister. And in most Western cultures, that left side is the bad side. So with that left hand, Jesus is condemning down into the bowels of hell. And your lovely host is that character right there. Can you make out the horns on his head? Okay, you know him as Satan, Lucifer, the devil, Beelzebub. Okay? And the single punishment in this hell image is for sinners to be eaten by him. Right? They are then digested by him. Okay, you see the legs dangling from his mouth. He's actually munching on a sinner as we speak. You are then excreted by him. Okay? And this is the part I pay a lot of money to see. Whatever comes out slowly regains its physical form and you get right back in line and it happens all over again for all eternity. Okay? And doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? Right? In fact, everyone around him is being prepared to be eaten. And my favorite figure of all is right there. Okay? This horizontal sinner. Horizontal because he's being slow roasted on a spit. No, it actually gets better. There's a demon standing by his feet, leaning over him with a ladle, and is actually basting him in the image, right? Because presumably Lucifer likes his meat moist as most of us do. Right? Now this is what I like to classify as a rated PG-13 hell image. All right? Because you'll find dozens of, of hell images in Florence alone, hundreds throughout Europe. Take a minute, look at the hell imagery, and I guarantee you many of you will be shocked by how graphic, oftentimes sexual in nature, the punishments get. So I see a lot of this going on. My goodness, I thought this was a church, right? You find it almost inappropriate to see this imagery, but remember, we are in the Middle Ages, right? The era of fire and brimstone. And most medieval Christians lived with the fear of eternal damnation on an almost daily basis, right? Uh, the art reflects the mindset of the society that produces it, and obviously this is not the most optimistic of societies, right? Okay, have the next. Okay. Before I ruin your trip entirely, okay, let's get out of the baptistry here. Let's talk about the building across the way. You know this as the Cathedral of Florence. You know this as the Duomo of Florence, right? And just to clear up the terminology, in order for a church to qualify as a cathedral, it has to have a, a bishop. Remember, a cathedral is a ranking for a church, technically. If you drop the letter L from the word cathedral, what remains is cathedra which is an old Greek word for seat or chair. So a cathedral is the seat of a bishop. Okay? As I remind all my students, all cathedrals are churches, but not all churches are cathedrals. Okay? You probably hear the word Duomo more often. And the word Duomo means? No, I baited you, but I've, in fact, nine out of 10 people think that Duomo means dome for two reasons, because it sounds so much like the English word and because look at the thing, I mean the dome just dominates the entire church. 